Hi, I'm Lance Lambert. Thanks for tuning in to the Vintage Vehicle Show. We are in Los Angeles, California at the Jim Davidson Collection. This is a great collection of cars and it's, it's a bunch that I really like. It's stuff that I can visualize myself owning and driving, so I'm real excited to look at these cars. And I'm excited to meet Jim Davidson. Come on in here, Jim. How are you? Lance? Thanks for coming over. Thank you for inviting us over. So, nice collection of cars. How did this come about? Well, I guess I've always been interested in cars, even when I was a little, little boy. Uh, but I do remember when I was about seven years old, a neighbor kid, a friend of my brother's, brought over a couple little model 54 Cadillacs, you know, the 124th scale model. I was just fascinated and it was kind of all downhill from there. Yeah. A lot of your stuff is Cadillac, Packard, uh, Soto, kind of the upper scale of the American yeah. stuff. And you even let a, a Rolls Royce sneak in the collection <laughs> here. Well, we're going to take a look at your collection and see some of the cars that I like the best. Maybe you can tell me some of the cars you like the best, so let's get started. Okay, great. All right. Jim, a lot of times when I'm doing collections like this, I sort of work up to what I think is the best in the collection, but I'm, I'm leaping up towards the top with this one, a 57 Adventure DeSoto. This is really a spectacular car. It is. The, these finned Chrysler products are real crowd pleasers. I think nothing typifies the 50s to most people as, as the... Uh, the 57 Chrysler products. And the DeSoto, I think, is the prettiest of all of them. And this is a unique car because they only built 1,500 coupes and then about 300 convertibles. Mm -hmm. So it was special that way. And like the Chrysler 300, it's got the Hemi with the two four barrels and a lot of uh, little special things. The car is about an inch lower than the regular 57 DeSoto. Better handling, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, the Adventure, um, you know, who, who bought that car back then? Well, I don't know who bought, all, in, generally as a rule, but I do know who bought this car because I met him. Uh, his name is Wayne Williamson. He was a fireman, L.A. County mm -hmm. fireman. Mm -hmm. And uh, he saw the car in the showroom and he loved it and he bought it. And for the next quite a few years, it was their family car. And then they gave it to their daughter and she drove it to high school. And finally, uh, the car just kind of was worn out. It had probably 150,000 miles. And they parked it in the backyard. And uh, it sat there for 15 years with a broken window under a tree and just deteriorating. And the, Wayne told me that he wanted to make it into a uh, Mercer raceabout because he always wanted one and figured he couldn't afford to buy one. So he said, I knew this car had a good engine and suspension, so I was going to take the body off and make my own body. And, but my wife wouldn't let me do it. Yeah, bless her heart. Yeah. <laughs> what makes an adventurer an adventurer? Well, again, the, uh, the engine modifications, the two four barrels and the uh, dual point ignition, uh, and the lowered suspension. But mainly, appearance-wise, that's what most of us notice. Uh, the color scheme was, you had only a couple of choices. You had white with gold, like this car, or the reverse, gold with white. And there were a few black and gold ones. They all had some form of this adventure gold color. And then on the tail fins, they've got the uh, checkerboard flag and the you know, forward look emblem. And uh, they all had uh, four headlights. Originally, the car came out, what, in October of 56? And it wasn't legal in every state to have four headlights. Right. So they held off on introducing this car until it was legal. I think it was January 1st or something. So they all have that. But you know, I think it's just a striking car. And oh, and the gold wheel covers, you gotta remember uh -huh. those. Yeah, I, I think sexy is a good word for yeah, this car. This, yeah. is, this is hot rod and sexy, it's beautiful. 1955 Packard, a little different color than I've seen before. And off camera, you corrected me. I said, this is a 400 and you said, it's the 400. Tell us about that. Right. Well, Packard, of course, has always appealed to the upper crust. And uh, there was some kind of a listing of uh, the foremost families in America or something. I think there were 400 families. And uh, they wanted to name their car after that. So just in case you didn't get the hint, <laughs> if, you, if you buy a car like this, you'd be one of them. Ah, I did not know that. What happened to Packard? Why did they peter out? Well, unfortunately, um, the main reason is because they merged with Studebaker. James Nance, who is president of Packard in starting in, I think, 52, decided that they should become a big company like General Motors. And they, if they were going to merge uh, Nash and & Hudson and Studebaker and & Packard, then merge those two companies, and then they have a big, strong 
contender. Well, unfortunately, it didn't quite go that way. Um, Nash and Hudson merged, but George Mason of Nash died of a heart attack shortly thereafter. And so the, the merger between Studebaker Packard and Nash and Hudson never happened. And Packard was very anxious to buy Studebaker, and they didn't bother to really research the books. And the, and the, uh, Studebaker was losing money at a pretty good rate. They had volume, and that's what Packard saw. And they, Studebaker presented them with a set of books that was misleading at best. And so when Packard purchased them, uh, they discovered that they were losing a lot of money. And Packard had cash until, they, until this happened. And the other problem is, in 55, they built a brand new factory. They had that fabulous uh, 1903 factory in Detroit, which is in ruins now. It's still there. But uh, Packard uh, decided they needed a new factory because uh, Briggs Body Company who had been building these bodies for Packard and they were purchased by Chrysler so they said well we can't do that anymore so Packard would have to build their own bodies so instead they built a whole new factory and they kind of threw it together and I heard even a story that when these cars would go down the assembly line uh, the the senior cars like the 400 and the patrician were long enough that the back end used to hit the corner when they, mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know if that's true, but they had a lot of production problems. Uh -huh. So even though this design by Dick Teague was very well received, it's essentially the 51 body that's been kind of fluffed up and they made it look very modern. Right. Yeah. And that it was a success. And that w along with the features like torsion level suspension and so on. Uh, but they had quality control problems and in 56 it got really bad. I think they had differentials failing at, you know, three or four thousand miles and that was kind of the last straw. What's a power plant in this? This is a 352 V8 and this is the first year for Packard's V8. That was another problem with Packard. They had that straight eight engine which was a good engine in its time but its time had come and gone and Cadillac had that nice overhead valve V8 right. and 49. Packard still had the straight eight. You know it had some torque but just didn't have the horsepower. And uh, finally they came out with a V8 and they had a few problems with it, but it's basically a pretty good engine. And uh, it goes very, fairly well. It, it has the biggest displacement of anybody in 55. Yeah, back in the day, to, to put a Packard motor in your, your five-window deuce coupe was, you know, that was a cool thing Is to that do right? back then. Yeah. I never had one of those. Yeah, yeah that, was, that was a good engine. A 65 Corvair. This is beautiful. I love Corvairs. I had a 62 convertible, one of my favorite all-time cars. I was active in Corsa, the, the National Club. What great cars he were, despite what Ralph Nader said and few people think, I thought these were wonderful cars. Well, they say it's an engineer's car and I guess it would be. Um, it was diff definitely different. Uh, this was the only rear engine American car that I can ever think of, uh, in, in the post-war era anyway. And uh, my dad had a Corvair. Actually, my brother got one first. His grandmother gave it to him for, uh, I don't know, getting good grades in college or something like that. And it just had, it was a 62 with just a power glide and a radio and heater, and that's it. But my dad liked the way it drove, so he bought one. He bought a 64 Monza, it was loaded with a four speed. Then he got a 65 four door hardtop. And we didn't know what the car was going to look like because he ordered it in April. But the only thing he did get to pick out then was the color, and he liked this color, Evening Orchid. This is a one year only, just Chevy and Pontiac. Couldn't get it on a Buick or anything like that. So anyway, he had that four-door hardtop, and that was really a good-looking car. And nobody knew what it was. We, we had like the first one in Phoenix, huh. and uh, it, was, it was fun. So I always wanted a Monza convertible, or, and I end up with this Corsa, which is quite a nice car. Back then, did your neighbors think it was something really exotic or something really odd? Or what was the reaction? Well, when the 65 came out, it was a really good-looking style. But when the 60s came out, you know, it was a Chevy, so people automatically are going to at least partly accept it. But uh, it was definitely different. The, the Falcon was the big seller, and, and the Valiant was a, a good car. And, uh, but it, the styling was a little different. Some people liked it, some didn't. Um, and the Corvair is just like a little bit different, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, back in, we used to live in, in Iowa, and back in Iowa, this was great in the snow because the weight over the driving wheels. But uh, they really were not a huge seller. It was it, it did well enough to be in production until '69, but 
they didn't actually burn up the world. And I, and I think uh, GM may have been a little disappointed in that. And they were more expensive to manufacture, too. That air-cooled engine and so forth, it was not cheap. Mm -hmm. And 69 was the last year, and they slowly sold less and less. What happened? Yeah. Well, a lot of people think that Ralph Nader is responsible with his book, Un Unsafe at Any Speed, but that's actually not really what happened. In fact, if anything, Ralph Nader prolonged the life of the Corvair because when the Mustang came out, of course, as we all know, it was a huge success. And Chevrolet was caught a little bit flat-footed, but they came out with a Camaro in 67, and they could make a lot more money off that car than they could the Corvair, and it was selling very well. So they just pretty much abandoned the Corvair. They quit advertising, uh, they discouraged taking orders, encouraging people to buy a Camaro instead. And uh, really, they probably would have dropped it in 67, except that uh, they didn't want to look like Nader had forced them uh -huh. to, into that position. So they kept it for two more years. Uh, when I would display my 62, I'd have a copy of Unsafe at Any Speed sitting on the dashboard. <laughs> and 100% of the time, people would walk by, see that, and just start laughing. Yeah. yeah. Well, they're a beautiful car, and, and uh, you know, I might have to go home with this. Uh, I, I, I'd say the chances of that happening are pretty slim. <laughs> I think this is the first Citroen we've had on the show. I, this is the 443rd, I think, episode of the show that we're taping right now. And all those episodes, I don't think we've ever featured a Citroen. So tell us about this one. Well, this car is a very unusual car, at least to most Americans. And I first learned about it when I was a little boy reading in magazines. And my dad, too, was interested in cars. And uh, this came out in 1956, um, actually the fall of 55. And it was a huge sensation at the Paris Auto Show. And they took, I think, 10,000 orders during the show for this car. And uh, it's remarkable in many ways. Uh, among them, the suspension, which is hydro pneumatic. And in fact, eventually, Rolls-Royce bought that, the right to produce that suspension on the Silver Shadow starting in 66. Very unique. It's a combination of air and oil and nitrogen spheres and all this complicated stuff, which I really don't understand completely myself. But when you drive the car, when you start the car, first of all, it's, it raises to normal riding height, first the back end and the front end. And then when you're driving and the car hits a bump, the suspension really completely absorbs the bump. It's quite remarkable. In, in the street near where I live, there's four big traffic bumps. And when you drive over in this car, you can go like 25. You don't even feel it. If you go in any other car, you better be doing 15. And uh, you can adjust the riding height if you, have, if you need higher ground clearance. You simply lift a lever. The car goes up. If you want to jack up the car, you take a little pedestal out from under the hood. You raise the car to its full height. Uh, which is pretty high, and you put this pedestal under the side that where you want to change the tire, you lower the car back, and when it does, it pulls lifts the wheels, the wheels up, up, and you can change your tire. Uh -huh. And in fact, everybody says, oh, does this really run on three wheels? Well, yeah, it will. Uh -huh. But I don't normally do that. Yeah. It's kind of hard on the car, but yeah, it does. I'm not a anything close to an expert on French cars, but what I know about Citroens, it seems like way back, Till you know, however recent they were making them, or still making them, they're they're really unique looking. Even for a French car, they look different yeah. than everything else. Well, um, <laughs> I have to say, yeah, it is unique looking, and, and the French think it's quite beautiful, and maybe it is. But to most Americans, I think it looked kind of bizarre. But I'll tell you what, this is a really interesting car, and if you've never sat in one, I invite you to try. Come on, let's let's take a look here. First thing when you sit in the seat, you notice that instead of a thin layer of foam over springs like American cars have, Very cushy. it's thick, it's entirely foam rubber. The whole seat is just foam rubber. And even the carpeting, underneath the carpet, there's a fo thick foam pad. So it's very comfortable to drive, and the seat's adjustable. Not power, unfortunately, didn't offer it, but there's a backrest adjustment, and you can tilt it and all that. So, and if you look at some of the other distinctive features of this car, look at the steering wheel. Right, it's that's, got that's really one unusual. spoke from the center to the edge. Mm -hmm. And I thought, 
you know, won't that snap off if you're driving the car? Mm -hmm. Apparently not. This yeah, car feels is solid. You're, you know, 40 something years old. Mm -hmm. And then all these little weird stalks on the steering column, and they've got no writing, they're just little pictures, and uh, you have to figure that out. The same thing with the heater. You can put your coffee here and just pull it right through the steering. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, one of the things that's a mystery in the hobby is how a, a car can be worth maybe not that much for a long time and then what almost seems like overnight to become very valuable. It seems like that is what I've observed with this body style and these Citroens. They, they're getting huge buddy for these now. Yeah, that's kind of a surprise to me too really and it started about the time I decided I had to have one unfortunately. Which, which side of it were you on? <laughs> the wrong side okay. as usual. But uh, I think what started it, it maybe the convertibles went for such huge money because they, they did build, I don't know how many, uh, just a few a year. You know, uh, Henri Chaperon was the designer, the stylist, and uh, they would take a sedan basically and cut the top off and make it into a two door and shorten it or whatever they do. And uh, they're so rare and so interesting that they started going for six figures and then, you know, double that. And it just had to drag the sedans up with it, I guess. That uh -huh. must be what happened. All right. Well, this is my first time sitting in one, so thank you. This is cool. Well, we'll have to go for a ride later. Okay.
65 Buick Wildcat. The word that jumps into my head here is manly. This is just, uh, you know, bright red, big convertible. Tell us about it. I think this is the car that, you know, the uh, well-to-do 40 to 50 year old uh, single guy would drive to the country club or something. But this has always been one of my favorites. And I had one when it was maybe three years old. Not as nice as this. It was identical looking, but it didn't have air conditioning, didn't have power windows. But I always loved that car. It was so smooth and so powerful. And I tried to uh, find one in the 80s, and I, I looked for about five years, and I couldn't find one. Finally, I started calling all my friends that collected cars and said, you know, did any of you guys ever see one of these that would be for sale? And I, I told the story about how I used to have one. And one of my friends says, well, I guess you haven't seen the San Gabriel Valley sports car trader. What? <laughs> anyway, he read me the ad, and by the time he finished reading the ad, the phone was like this, and I was uh, in the car. All right. And uh, I bought this from the original owner. Um, it was not in this condition, but it was, the interior was nice. Um, it needed a paint job really badly. She used it as a doorstop for her other car that she bought after this and needed a top and so on. And then I added the few options it didn't have and made it into the car I always wanted. I, I'm feeling a sense of passion on this car. This, is this one of the special ones in your collection? Well, they're all special, but okay. this is, really is a nice driving car. And you know, this has the optional engine, uh, the uh, Super Wildcat V8, which is two four-barrel carburetors. That's kind of unnecessary because the regular engine is so powerful as it is, but why not waste more gas? Yes. <laughs> what was the cu cubic inch on that? Uh, 425. Okay. Standard was 401, optional was 425, and then you could get on top of that the Super Wildcat engine. I think it was 365 brake horsepower. This is a big car. Do you, does it take some, especially like if you were driving the Corvair one day and then you jump into this, do you feel like you're in a giant car or it just, uh, you know, you sink into it right away and, and everything works out? Not to me because, you know, when I was in high school and stuff or, or younger, cars were this size, generally speaking. And uh, it's not as big as that Lincoln convertible over there. So, yeah, it's kind of, in fact, even the Electra is longer than this. They put extra length in the quarter panel. And uh, no, it, it feels like it's just agile, is the way I would describe this. Huh, yeah, you don't think of a 65 Buick as agile, but uh, I guess the Wildcats yeah. are, huh? And you know, you touch the gas pedal and pushes you back in your seat, but very smooth and quiet, and uh, it's, it's fun to drive. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's got the styling that I especially like this yeah. year. Yeah, it's a beautiful car. Jim, thank you very much for letting us come look at your collection. It is very impressive. I really had a good time here. Thanks for coming over. It was fun. I bet. And I hope it was fun for you. And Jim promised me a ride in this Citroen. It'll be my first ride in a Citroen, I think. So this is kind of exciting. And I hope it was exciting for you. We had a great time here. Hope you did too. So until next time, we'll see you then. Bye-bye.